Welcome to the East Oakland I know, one of the last predominantly black neighborhoods left in a city that was once nearly 50% African American. From the hills to the flatlands, about 87,000 people from the town call East Oakland home. This is the story of a 10 year struggle to rise up, fight against health inequalities, gentrification, environmental racism, and housing discrimination. This story is a blueprint for what it takes to change unfair systems, protect the win, and thrive to fight another day. It's the reason why we call it the hood because we lost the neighbor aspect. East Oakland I grew up in, we know our neighbors. Knock on the door, can I borrow some sugar? If I got into trouble, my friend's mother can punish me. We knew each other, there was trust. Cracking the violence completely obliterated that trust. And now people can live in an apartment building and don't even know the name of the person living next door to them. I've seen the absolute systemic reduction of our ability to live. As with the Black Panthers, we have nowhere else to go but the ocean. So. We're turning around, we're facing forward, and we have to have place here. When you raise up the issues of African Americans, you raise up the issues of all people. When we work together, we can do all kinds of things. Over these 10 years with East Oakland Building Healthy Communities and in East Oakland, there's been a lot of victories, there's been a lot of wins. The fight was a good fight to get those things and to win those campaigns and to go after those um, decision makers and, and and go after those landlords. We have to continue to take steps forward and really uh, make sure that we don't lose what we gain and make progress so that we just have the same quality of life that all aspire for in America. A day in the life of East Oakland consisted of going to school, going home, uh, playing with our friends in the streets, you know, waiting on the ice cream truck to come, yelling, Mama, Mama, let me get a quarter so I can buy a popsicle. My dad and my uncles were Panthers. My mother and her brother were members of the Nation of Islam. So I was raised with the foundation of blackness. I was academically bright. I skipped from the first to third grade. Uh, by the time I got to sixth grade, I literally won every academic achievement award there. All the businesses where I grew up at on 92nd and Holly, they were black owned. And we had programs, we had services for young people like myself. Once the drugs came in, everything shifted overnight. I mean, stores left, people who had money moved out the hood, more police, less services. We've seen the impact in schools, we've seen it with the slashing and funding for programs and services. And the violence just took off. So did mass incarceration. So I was someone as a teenager began selling drugs and then I was arrested at 16 years old and tried as an adult. The only place in America where guaranteed a roof over our head is in prison. But when I paroled in 2012, and mind you, I did my prison time out of state. So when I returned to Oakland, all of a sudden, as I'm looking for places to live, I'm seeing this box in the application. Have you ever been convicted of a felony? Then the next question is, if so, what was it for? Imagine that for a second. Before they even have a chance to meet me, to learn anything about me or my story, I am required to give, which is typically the most negative thing about me that I can offer. And Oakland was a place that if you were evicted on a Monday, you can always find another place by Wednesday. Like nobody wanted to come move to Oakland. But it's like all of a sudden Oakland became this place to be and the rents began to double, triple, even quadruple. Predatory lending hit East Oakland, foreclosures hit East Oakland. Um, now pandemic hit, hit East Oakland and what we see is a lot of homeless folks. A lot of my friends who are living on the streets that I grew up with um, close to their house. 70% of unhoused folks are black people who live really in East Oakland. And so that can't stand. Um, we have a right to have a good existence, to have homes, to have peace, to have place. My family story is really similar to many uh, black folks who came here from the South to escape all of the terrorism um, in the South, um, in West Oakland. They were displaced to different locations, um, returned to East Oakland, could not buy property on the other side of the tracks. So at some point my father and my family could buy something. We moved there. I mean, I grew up in Oakland where I'd spend time in the Fruitvale and Chinatown and everywhere in the parks and we never felt like 
we were didn't belong. I go to Uptown sometime now, and I walk into a bar when you could walk in, and I'm just like, do people just stop and stare at me like I don't belong? We have to access property. As I went to school and really studied how wealth was built in America, 70% of people who have built wealth have built it in real estate. So it's pretty simple. I like simple formulas. You want to do well and have access to things, you have to own property. I'm, I'm a Sunday school teacher. I also uh, belong to the Women's Missionary Society. We help do things for people in the community. One of my sons, Simabrache, was a very inquisitive child, had an uh, excellent memory. Some of the neighborhood guys approached him and uh, asked him to be their lookout. And as a result, uh, he started hooking up the wrong folks. Rache wound up being sent to state prison. But when he came out for this, this uh, felony conviction, he could not stay with me because I'm, I live in housing. Oakland Housing Authority at that time did not allow anybody with a, a felony record to stay with you in housing. So he stayed with uh, friends, he lived in cars, he sometimes he slept in the park. I was part of something called the real team in the city of Oakland with the East Oakland Building Health and Communities. And we felt it was important to address the, how, how people were getting into housing, how records were being kept, um, and the fact that discrimination was taking place on a lot of levels. What we've been seeing here in Oakland is the real erasing of black and brown culture. Um, you know, African American, indigenous, Latinx, as well as Asian immigrant and refugee. And if we're not intentional about really building a deep partnership to maintain that, I think everyone's fear is that it's going to lead to even more erasure of what has historically been Oakland. When I was an undergraduate student at San Jose State, I took an environmental studies class and it changed my whole perspective on everything. I stopped driving my car, started riding a bike everywhere. I started growing food at a community garden. I started composting and I drove my family crazy. Then, about a semester or two later, I got involved in the Pan-African movement and I, I made them even more crazy because they were like, get away from here with all that Africa stuff and all that environmental stuff. What's wrong with you? <laughs> well, the Healthy Development Guidelines came about Early on in the work with East Oakland Building Healthy Communities, I was the chair of the Land Use Built Environment Work Group early on while I was still with Communities for a Better Environment. The crematorium was the best example of environmental racism in, in the city of Oakland because there was no environmental review. They gave these folks a permit to burn 3,000 bodies a year. We have a lot of asthma in East Oakland. We also have a lot of uh, uh, heart disease and other things, health issues in Oakland. And those things were amplified by the creation of the crematorium. You know, most of the planning department um, staff are white the planners and they don't live, and the people who do permits, and they don't live in Oakland, let alone East Oakland. They didn't do any public announcement. And so when we started organizing against the crematorium, the entire city council agreed with us that this was an example of environmental racism. So the planning department and the city, it shamed them and it made them, you know, say, okay, well, we need to work more with community when we do development in their neighborhood. And when we give permits that are gonna bring pollution, we need to have a different way. And we had advisors to craft, help us craft the healthy development guidelines. We did community surveys of what the people wanted to see in this. And we also uh, worked with folks who were developers and also people in the community who were being directly affected. At Public Health, I think we talk a lot about health is everything and we talk a lot about taking the data to action, but the reality is what brings it to act, the data to action is actually the community organizing and building of the resident leaders. We can turn out as many maps and tables as we want, but it's not gonna mean anything if the residents aren't understanding it, embracing it, putting their stamp of approval, and going to City Hall and saying, we want action now. And as a result, we crafted it, we uh, educated people on it, uh, folks worked with us on it, and after five years, we were able to get it passed. The planning department changed 
how developers have to fill out the application to get a permit, the basic application. They have to report how they're going to do community engagement and they have to re um, collect data on any displaced residents because of their project. That's never been on the books before. I did five years in prison, so when I came home in 2012, this was at the forefront of what we're experiencing now, the housing crisis, gentrification, and displacement. And at this time, when I came home, I was unemployed for 18 months, despite being a licensed aircraft mechanic. I have two strikes, couldn't find a job, have kids to feed. So I had to do what I had to do, and I went back to hustling. But I understand fully I didn't have the same bandwidth as other people, meaning if I was arrested, that third strike could be any felony. And I knew for a fact I didn't want to spend the rest of my life in prison. I was desperate. I was like, no, I have to give this up. I have to do something different. And my buddy was telling me that they were having this meeting uh, involving East Oakland Building Healthy Communities at Allen Temple. So I go in there and they had this great community event. They had a soul train line. And what I felt was a sense of community, something I didn't feel for a long time. And they had a program called The Real Team that was Residential Engagement and Leadership Opportunity. I've known Miss Sherry. Actually, I met her through the real team. Uh, the first meeting I went to with EOBAC, and we've just been tight since. Uh, she's like an auntie to me. She's someone who deeply inspires me because her passion. Like, to be honest, there are very few people I feel who passion matches mine. Uh, she is someone who's just been throwing down for the longest of time. And mind you, not from a paid capacity either. Even though people had served their time, they were even penalized more when they came out and might have been working and trying to secure housing. So we felt it was a need to step up to the plate and make sure that people who were coming, our returning citizens were able to secure housing. And so it was really important to make this uh, uh, non-adversarial, but to also work to the, with the council to see what, what needed to be included in the ordinance here. Uh, one of the things we did is that rather than just saying, well, uh, we, we, you, you got to do this and you got to do that. We came to them saying uh, we, we need to have this ordinance passed that this is affecting uh, the rise in homelessness in Oakland. Uh, for them, it might represent a safety issue, but we also knew, knew that a lot of these are people that we know, friends and relatives and family. After he came out, uh, he was very much changed. He wanted to make sure that nobody fell back into the kind of life he had gone through. And so he started doing street ministry, brought some young men to Christ, talked to folks about uh, doing th different things in their life other than just being on the streets. He loved children. He spent a lot of time with his children. It was very hard that he had no place to bring them to on a regular basis. And the only time he could see them is when they came to my house on the weekend. Rashi uh, decided, I need a fresh start, and he went to Los Angeles with his girlfriend. I remember it was September 17, 2019, and he called me at about 6.30 that morning. His girlfriend had gotten a job. He had just drove her to work, and he had came back home, and I asked him, is everything all right? He said, yes. He said, well, all I do is I go to the store and come back, and I do my meditation, and I do my Bible study and other things. I had talk, finished talking to Rache about seven o'clock. So I had a meeting with the Berkeley City Council around the Fair Chance Housing Ordinance. So I went there to tell them my story and by, that my son should have been able to live with me rather than being unhoused so, for so many years. Several hours later, I found that Rache had been, uh, some of Rache had been shot to death. The neighbor claimed that Rache was making too much noise. He and the neighbor were arguing through the wall of the apartment, the next door neighbor. Rache came out, knocked on the man's door uh, to talk to him, and the man shot him to death. I mean, even now, it's making me emotional. Um, we had a meeting in Berkeley, and some of the council members were in, well, not direct opposition to the ordinance, but they had some concerns. You know, one said, well, maybe we should delay implementing this ordinance because they wanted to get reelected. Another one was concerned about carve outs. You know, would this apply to people that's on Megan's Law? What about people with violent convictions? And all this was going on when we received word. Ms. Sherry had called me three hours after that meeting and shared that her son was murdered. And when we shared that with the council member, it transformed her because she was a mother. And the idea that a mother who give birth to a child 
is not allowed to provide housing for the same child. Something about that is just insane, it's criminal. I feel that if Rashi had been up here with me and I'd been able to stay, that, that he would still be alive. Through my faith in God, I've been able to make it through a lot of this. Uh, it has not been easy. I decided, to be, you know, despite this going, my sister Marashi's death, his death was not going to be in vain. And then I will continue to, to uh, work with the Fair Chance Housing Coalition. And that's just what I did. Item 13 is adopt a Fair Chance Housing Ordinance adding Oakland Municipal Code Chapter 8.25, prohibiting consideration of criminal histories in screening applications for rental housing. Several years ago, my son Simarache made a mistake that cost him and me dearly. I had to take my son off my housing lease and put him out on the street. That was a very hard decision for me to make as a mother. Policy is not a matter of dotting I's nor crossing T's. It's not a matter of just us sitting down and saying, okay, this might be feasible, this might be possible. We have to always consider the human element of any policy we are working on. This ordinance is about removing a barrier that so many members of our community face to obtaining housing. We know in this housing crisis we need to stop displacement, prevent homelessness. This will make it easier for folks uh, coming out of the criminal justice institution to be able to live like everyone else. It's probably an ordinance that means more to me, um, given the situation that, that my son now finds himself in and wanting to make sure that when he does come out in September that he will not have as hard a time as others have had in finding a place uh, to live. They got right on it, and uh, they worked with the rest of the Oakland City Council and unanimously passed the Fair Chance Housing Ordinance. It's called the Ron Dillums and Simba Rache Sherry Fair Chance Housing Ordinance. A historic vote in Oakland. It's now the first major California city to ban criminal background checks for tenants. Supporters say this will help combat homelessness. It passed in Oakland in January, and we had a similar uh, ordinance passed in Berkeley. So as a result of the ordinance passing, I was able to ramp up my search for housing. And mind you, when I worked on that campaign and when the ordinance was approved, in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, I probably still gonna be stuck in the hood, probably in some apartment somewhere I probably don't wanna be, but I'd rather be there than where I currently was living at that time. I was really uh, renting two rooms in a renovated basement. So in my search, I ran across this brand new house and I applied. And when you apply, as someone with a record, there's always that anxiety that comes up, the butterflies, because, you know, we experience here and know so often. And the question, coincidentally, was on the application. Now, mind you, in our ordinance, landlords are not allowed to have that on their application, but we built in a six-month grace period. And there was another question that said, do you consent to a criminal background check? I wrote, no. And then in the box, I wrote, open a fair chance housing ordinance. The owner and the realtor who was conducting the application, neither one spoke about it, Neither one questioned me on it. I was approved and my family moved into this beautiful brand new home May 1st of this year. And above all, as a parent, you know, as a father, you know, a single father of two, especially my youngest son, five, knowing that he has free space, he has his own room. We have an enclosed backyard to where he can get fresh air and exercise safely. It's just a beautiful thing. And I'm honestly, I'm still pinching myself. We are working on the implementation phase and by us being in conjunction with people in the community, our coalition, and we also have uh, legal advocates who are working with us, we can make sure that we can protect the win. I think we're making progress. I think the first and key thing is that we collaborate with each other and that we're organized, different organizations, black-led, ally-led organizations, and that we have the same focus to not get distracted. And we go after it and support each other, joint fundraising, joint activity, no competition, then we can do anything. What would it look like to, to acquire land, to have a space and a place where people can live? where they can exist. We need a safe place. So Just Cities and Eastside Arts Alliance were the main architects in, in putting together the East Oakland Black Cultural Zone. We were bringing up the name, we were saying Black Cultural Zone. 
We talk about cultural hubs, and we're talking not just about the cultural center, but about plazas. And plazas throughout the rest of the world are places where communities organize, where people come together. The community comes together and builds relationships and builds power. Like, that was the ultimate goal. There's a lot of things that folks can do with the right built infrastructure in neighborhoods and the right investment that we can look out for ourselves. You know, we can figure this out. And with the right health dollars, we can figure out how to respond to folks' stress and mental illness. You know, there's a lot of things that communities can do, that idea of self-determination. We are licensing the lot from the city, and it's at Eastmont Mall, which is, you know, if you're from East Oakland back in the day, that was the place to be. And so it's a vacant lot that the city owns, 50,000 square feet. We're going to have an outdoor cultural hub, farmer's market, arts and culture, music, movie nights, all kind of stuff there. And we are hoping that as we hold place for black people, businesses in the East Oakland community in general, that when they do go to sell that property, that they will sell it to the Black Cultural Zone or the trust that we'll have for Black Cultural Zone projects. For me, as a Chinese-American woman, I benefited tremendously from growing up around African-American culture and really in a hub um, you know, of Black history, Black culture, and Black resistance. And all of those things shaped who I am. Oakland is not just an edgy slogan to wear on a t-shirt. It really, for those of us who grew up here, it really means something. I think that we still have a diverse community. It doesn't look like it looked like 15 years ago, but there still are people of color in Oakland, black folks in Oakland. There are still some neighborhoods that are predominantly black. And I think it's really important so my role is a couple of things. One is to organize sort of the how we achieve the purpose, which is to build thriving black communities. And so organizing the strategic work groups that we have, our purpose, our focus, our activities and action. The second is to really kind of lead the effort to hold place for black people and businesses, which means we have to identify properties to buy and acquire. Um, leasing doesn't work. And how do we then also put in structures of financing those properties so that People can own them and not just have one entity or one individual own them. So we're looking to figure out those structures and then I have to find the money, um, along with all the other organizers to fund it from a variety of sources, loans, equity, investments, individuals. So we have to put the whole package together. We've thought about it and talked about it. Now it's time to get it done. And the role of the East Open Black Culture Zone, for a lot of people who don't even realize this, is when we talk about police brutality, this is how we end it. This is how we end relying on an archaic system for safety, by creating space and a place for people to come together so we can know who our neighbors are, so we can rebuild that trust, so that way we can be responsible for our own health and safety in our community. This struggle for agency, for power building, you know, it, it's just like a hand that has all these different issues, environmental racism, you know, housing injustice and unfair policies, economic um, inequalities, health disparities, and all these different organizations that are working on all these things separately, you know, each one of them could be broken individually. But when we come together, what, what power and agency is really about is those organizations coming together like the fist. And so please raise your fist for the power building that we have been doing and that we're gonna continue doing for the next 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. You have to talk to people being willing to listen to other sides of the argument. And if you think it's gonna take a little while, it's all right. Don't give up. The pursuit of justice is not something that comes easy, but it can get done. And that's something no one can take from you. It's like when people say get an education, once you get a degree, no one can take that from you. To me, it's the same thing with policy wins, especially when you're directly impacted. When you are proactive in addressing and fighting for change, not waiting for other people to agree with you, not waiting for the money to come, not hoping that the government fixed it. We did it. I grew up in the East and went to church in the West. Graduated in 07, but I'm still getting tested. Born in the late 80s when crack was going crazy right after the Black Renaissance. My mama taught me love, get the best response. It's a city that I love and I'ma carry on. East Oakland, we surviving, keep hoping, keep thriving. From seminary where I used to see my cousin driving. Wasn't in that box shed, then you wasn't riding. Trunk shaking rattle when that thing rolled by. Side shows at the East, my mall. It's around the time every white tee got tall. Really from the town, start another one soon as they shut it down. Before life went digital, had digital underground. It's time we take a stand, liberate the land. But let's keep it a grand, they don't want to see us do it. The black
Black Panther Party was really getting to it. Power to the people, to the culture, and the music. We fight for this soil. We got roots running through it. Fighting for East Oakland. We got roots running through it. What if we made the hood a neighborhood? It ain't enough to say we could. We really got to come together. What if we made the hood a neighborhood? Link up and do some good. Own it now. It starts forever. Oh, oh. It's going to take us to save us. It's gonna take us to save us. Ooh. It's gonna take us to save us. It's gonna take us to save us. I used to hoop it EOYDC. Tim Pearson, Quentin Thomas on my rival teams. I had them brand new pennies when I arrived on the scene. Oakland makes my memories. I hope it remembers me. Cause I don't wanna be left in the dust. We need a place to call our own. We need a zone for us. Had to let go of the crib when Pops passed away. But it's okay, cause I plan to buy it back one day. We gon' have to make our own plans. Let's take the future in our own hands. Ain't no more asking demand. Let's take action. I said with pride and much passion. The town helped make me so I gotta make it happen I've been going nuts I'm talking three times crazy got hella songs but too short and I'm still in amazement every time we think we up we still in the basement the villain is hatred but we killing displacement unity is the ammunition community is the only mission every block in every district this is where it starts on your marks but to the finish what if we made the hood a neighborhood it ain't enough to say we could we really gotta come together what if we made the hood a neighborhood? Link up and do some good. Own it now, it starts forever. Uh oh. It's gonna take us to save us. It's gonna take us to save us. Ooh. It's gonna take us to save us. It's gonna take us to save us.